Okay. So let's jump right in. Um, oh, everyone's got one of these, right? Okay, the two people who are running here, and I made 20 copies. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about icy moons today. And after we talk about icy moons, it'll be really quick. We may or may not get to light. Um, so next Tuesday, we'll talk about light and how we use that. And in particular, how that basically drives all of the atmospheric phenomena that we see. Okay. Um, yeah, what is this? Good question. Yeah, what are we? What are we? Name anything in this picture. Acceptable answers include yellow. Volcano. Okay, volcano, yellow. What's that? Orange. <laughs> that's, that's correct. I like that answer. Which? It's square, second square. Second square? Yeah, like that. Part, like that little, Here? No, I'm just asking. Here? Here? Uh, yeah, like all that. Yeah, very good. Like it looks funny. Looks funny. Yeah, it doesn't look like what we normally yeah, see. Right? Yeah, there's like some, there's like some crust bread. Yeah. Okay, good. So there's some crust on this planet. Um, there's some holes in the planet. These circular things we identified on Venus. Was that craters? Uh, I don't see any craters here. Something like that might look like a crater at first, but it doesn't quite have the shape that we normally like. So either this is like an old crater that's eroded kind of, um, but I know personally it's not. So that's a trick, right? But what about this one here? What else is circular that we've seen? Yeah, you know, that's what that's what she mentioned. These ones here, right? Could be could be um, thought of as impact craters. So we have erosion. We've said impacts. for the other two? What's that? Volcanoes. So when we looked at Venus, we saw like a dark piece here, and then like circles around them. And what we would notice too is that at the edges of them, it looked like it was pushing material out of the way, right? So this brand new material would be coming off of this object that was dark at the very top. And indeed that's a volcano. So <clears throat> what would we expect for this knowing that it's a terrestrial planet? We said things along the lines of, we expect it to be large because it's still active. Um, there was not a lot of impact cratering. So the surface was young. Uh, we said that it probably had a very thick atmosphere if it had outgassing. And of course, I dropped the bomb on you that none of those are correct, and it's IO. And you were all really upset, and you're like, why don't you come to this class? And then if you didn't, that's OK. Um, and so here's IO. So IO is 3,600 kilometers. Um, it's a little bit larger than the moon but not that much larger than the moon. And of course, when you make that comparison between here and here, you say, well, should I just ignore everything you said about size? That seems really stupid. Um, and we're gonna talk about why when you move farther away from the sun, the idea of what we think about as rocks, the idea of what we think about at the surface and the processes that happen there can change slightly. So we'll see the same physical phenomena We'll see volcanoes, we'll see tectonics, we'll see ridges, but they'll be caused by something different. Okay. Um, on the left, this is Ganymede, big, big one. Callisto, you know that. Um, is that the right ordering, by the way? Does anyone know? We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, this is super volcanically active, but small, and we want to answer why. 
Okay. <clears throat> In general, maybe this is not totally true. Um, the ones that we're going to see, a lot of the ones that we're going to see, they're small, and yet they're really active geologically. And this will come from the fact that they are moons. So they're going to be interacting with their host planet. So we're not going to have enough time. I mean, I could have a whole class on moons, but I think you would get bored. Um, these are the ones that are probably dumb. So these are the smallest ones. You can see these are to scale. They're not spherical. Um, so when you think about asteroids, you've seen it in, say, Star Wars or Star Trek. They're like these rocks that are sort of bumpy. They're not spheres. You have to get big enough so that gravity crushes the rock. And these are simply not big enough to crush the rock. When we see comets later on, comets, not comets, comets, which are those things that we see across the sky, those ones look really funny. They look like potatoes put together. Um, here's the ones that are big, sort of in the context of like large. Um, they're all spherical after a certain size. So here on the bottom is the scale, 3,000 kilometers. And there's our moon, for example. This is Pluto. Pluto small. Um, this one's Titan. Titan big, right? So this one here, you're talking about how you hate moons. Who's talking about how they hate moons? You were talking about how you hate moons. But this one's bigger than a planet that we traditionally think about, right? Substantially. And Ganymede's massive, right? So here's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And we'll try and go through as many of these as we can. We'll come back to Titan. Titan's really cool. Um, and if you saw today's um, um, JWST image, you saw a picture of Triton. So that's on here too. Triton is also massive. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So if we recall when we were talking about Galileo, he we so if you were just like 400 years earlier, you could name stuff. Um, you don't get to name as many things anymore, even if you find them. But he gets all of these called after them. Um, this is Jupiter in his original pictures, and he just saw these little tiny dots. And he figured out that they were orbiting Jupiter as opposed to orbiting us. So again, this is evidence that the idea of an Earth-centric model, everything that's orbiting us, can't possibly be correct. And as telescopes got better, and as we headed there, um, we could take better and better pictures. We even named the spacecraft out after him, this one here. Um, so that's like the dish sends us back information. And we can get really close and we can take pictures that look like this. Okay. So the ordering is correct here. Io is the closest, not to scale here, but just in order. Then Europa, then Ganymede, and then Callisto. Okay. What? Yeah. What, why the different order there is Europa? Uh, whoever made the graphic. I tried to make this one correct because we're going to zoom in on this one. Um, one thing that you want to look at here. Uh, when you look at, say, here's Io and Europa, we're going to zoom into these surfaces. There's Enceladus and Titan. Those are Saturn's moons. And then you look over here at Triton, you're really not seeing a lot of cratering. And that's telling you that the surfaces are really new. Now, that may seem to break the rules for terrestrial geology, but that's because it's not terrestrial. Terrestrial, we're really thinking about like rock as the primary surface, and rock is a lot harder to deform requires more temperature. Ice is really easy to deform. So we can melt it with relative ease. Does that make sense? Right. Oops, hold on, let's go back there. Yeah, we're gonna talk about something called tidal heating. Um, it's a new heat source. And as we said, the composition is really important. There. When we say tidal heating, this does indeed refer to the tides, but it doesn't mean that there's necessarily ocean currents. Yeah. On Europa, what's called an olive one? We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. So in order to understand this, we have to understand um, uh, something called orbital resonances and how tides are formed. Okay. So we're going to introduce two pretty unusual concepts, and hopefully we'll break them down in a fairly straightforward way, um, and see how these can 
deform an entire planet. So the first one is called an orbital resonance. This is the correct um, orbital configuration, but they're not to scale, okay? But what happens here, I want you to sort of pay attention to one of these, right? So this one's going around, this is Io, it's on the inside, and then Europa, and then Ganymede. And you'll notice that for every time that Io goes around once, Europa's gone around halfway, and Ganymede has gone around a fourth of the way, or a quarter of the way. And we can invert those ratios. So when Ganymede goes around once, Io has gone around four times, and Europa has gone around twice. That's what these little numbers here mean. So when Ganymede has gone around once, Io has gone around four times, okay? What does this mean? It means that they keep returning to exactly the same place at fixed times. So if I look, let's say they're, let's say that this orbit is one day. It's not, but let's say it was. And I look four days later, it would be in exactly the same configuration as when I looked the first time. And it turns out you have some personal familiarity with this, okay? So you're, let's say, on a swing set, okay? You're going on the swing, you're going back and forth. If you're getting pushed by like your little cousin, they're just randomly hitting you, do you get going really high up? No, no, you have to like wait till you're all the way at the end and then they push you. You wait till they're at the end and then they push you. You wait till you're in and then they push you, right? So if you're getting hit repeatedly at the same time, you can get a much bigger effect than if it were just randomly being hit by, say, your cousin, right? The same thing is true here. The fact that they are coming back to these same places every single time allows them to participate in something very unusual. And I'll show you that in a few seconds. Okay. They can change their orbital shape. Instead of being just circles, they can be those ellipses we talked about. Remember ellipses were just squished circles, like an elephant sitting on top of it. Okay. And that ellipticity, the fact that it's not a circle, means that the forces on each one of these bodies is changing. Okay. So if I get closer, the force of gravity gets Bigger or strong, or bigger or smaller? Bigger. So if I get closer to something, the gravitational force gets larger. And I move away, it gets smaller. And bigger, it gets smaller. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about the tides on Earth. Folks know about how the tides form? Okay, it's not. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so if you've ever been to Little Beach, okay, everyone in California has been on the beach. All right, sometimes people have been on the snow. That's not that surprising, um, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the beach. So why, why are there tides? Tides are different than waves. Waves are from wind, basically pushing the air, or the air pushes the water, the water falls over, believe it or not. But then you have these really weird things. So you imagine there's all of this water on the earth, just not to scale, okay? If I were to scale, we'd be very dead. <laughs> um, but think about it this way. Most of the earth is really water, right? Like 70% of the surface is water and it's almost all connected. So there really is like a bulge. Um, it's only a few meters, right? But you do notice that difference depending on where you are on the planet. So for example, if you're up here in Nova Scotia, you might've seen pictures of like the boats falling out of the harbor, right? Those are high and low tides. Whereas if you're at the equator, they tend to be more, um, they tend to be smaller in their effect. And we wanna talk about why this happens. So you'll see these fun little arrows. Um, over here, there is a tidal bulge. That's the water being pulled to the moon, right? Everyone's like, okay, that kind of makes sense. You're closer, so it's pulling on you harder. Why is there one on the other side? Okay, so if the picture had the sun in here, that could be important, but these are both caused just by the moon.
Yeah. Gravity is still pulling this side or this side? Yeah, so there's this gravity is smaller, the force of gravity here than here, right? But in the middle, the Earth is also being pulled. Is this what you're talking about? <laughs> um, essentially, what's happening. So the Earth is being pulled towards the moon, like the moon is being pulled towards the Earth. We already saw that, right? And in fact, they're orbiting like this. Okay. Now, this one doesn't move as much as this one does, because this one is more massive, but it's still getting pulled. And in fact, the reason we have a bulge on the other side is because this water is essentially left behind. Okay. So you can imagine that it's making a small motion here. Um, this one's going around like that. So it's going around a small point in between the two of them. And this water here is being sort of thrown off the planet, being left behind. Is that more or less confusing? Because the result is the result of the moon. Yes, they're both the result of the moon. And that's why they're both. But the water pushes it back. They're both pointing in the direction of the moon. Right? The water pushes it back. The water is not pushing anything. Right here, on this part here, it's not being pulled as much as this is being pulled. All of this object is in orbit around this. In the same way that we think about an orbit, right? This object is going around this. So you can just imagine what it would be like to be on the moon. It would look like the Earth is going around you, right? Those are equal, right? So the only thing that's happening here is when we calculate the force here, you're closer. So it pulls up, but you're also pulling the earth more toward you and you're leaving behind this bulge of water, right? Uh, this part that's being pulled less, believe it or not, is high tide. And here in between these two pieces is low tide. So you get a total of two high tides per day and two low tides per day. Weird, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is only important to show you that imagine you have all of this water, the shape that you end up getting, it's like an ellipse, like a squish circle again, right? Okay. So the moon is currently on a near circular orbit. If it were instead in a more elliptical orbit, would the moon experience a greater smaller for the same range of tidal forces. All right, show me your fist when you're ready. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, interesting. All right, anyone want to defend their answer? Most people said one and two. So I think a lot of people weren't convinced by my the same argument. So if you change something, obviously something's going to change. I'm not tricky today. Or you tricked me with the ice moons. Okay. 
and the other there's a book people eventually on wherever you would see the farthest from the center and it's less than okay. So I think actually the way that you said that is correct, but I think based on your argument, I would choose greater because of the word range, right? Because you just said if you were circular, right? Then you would have stronger all the way around. But if you had an ellipse, when I'm over here, like you mentioned, it would actually get smaller. So you go between a, a big amount and a small amount, right? So when you're elliptical, actually you experience it's, you're absolutely right. And when you're closest in a circular orbit, that's when you have the largest forces. What I want here is the range of forces. And this would be the greater range of forces when I'm elliptical. You can imagine this is really, really squished, right? Let's imagine that it goes like this, all the way out. And here, the, the massive tidal forces. Now, not here, I would feel almost no tidal force at all. Right? In fact, we feel very little to no tides from the sun sun's really far away. Okay. So these two concepts, orbital resonances and tides, are going to give us the surface geology we're about to see. Okay. So which one was it smaller? Which one was it? Greater. Good. Okay, so let's look at Io in more detail. So here's the picture of Jupiter. Um, when we're looking at it here, it's being continually flexed throughout its orbit. Um, it's a plaything for, for Jupiter. It's literally being pulled around. And so when it's close, the near part to it is getting pulled and it's becoming this weird little oval shape. And then when it is far away, it can go more back towards a circular shape. But as you're doing that, it's like playing with a piece of um, like silly putty, right? And as you play with it, you're, you're heating it up and it's becoming more squishy essentially. So the orbital resonances um, allow us to be elliptical, and the ellipticity um, allows us to have huge tidal forces on the surface, okay? Um, and that's called tidal heat. So you may, you may think about like, well, okay, did the ocean heat up the earth? Kind of. Um, and in fact, there is even like um, people who want to put turbines like wave generators, so they can harness that energy. The energy is coming from the moon. Pretty cool. Okay. And this is really the relative size, just for scale here. Um, here's Io at 2,000 miles across and like just massive, right? Jupiter big. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of the great red spot, like that's the size of the Earth. So this giant thing can fit like 300 Earths in it. It has no problem pulling on this tiny little moon. Okay. Um, we'll talk more about Jupiter in just a second. Um, come on now. Okay, so there's the surface again. Um, it's almost the same size as our moon, um, but you see that this is a an image that if you're familiar with like um uh like how sulfur is produced. Sulfur mines, for example, in Africa, different parts of the world, they're very yellow. Sulfur itself is yellow. And this indeed is the same thing. Um, when we fly a spacecraft over it, we can get the composition of this material. And this is all brand new sulfur. Now it's mixed into ice. So it's not rock all the way through. In fact, the exterior of this is icy. And then there's just volcanoes happening on top of the ice. So that's a little weird to you. That's OK. You have like magma shoots up through the ice, um, then it hits the coldness of space. And we already know what happens when things are cold. They go from being magma to being rock, right? And they just fall on the surface. Okay. So this is an example of it. Here, I think, is Prometheus plume. Um, so cool. <laughs> this has been in every photo we've ever taken of Io since 1978. And think about the size here, right? So this is a 2,000 miles across. It's like 90 miles up. So this thing has like been erupting for 40 years, 50 years. Um, and this type of object we see all over the place. So here's a little zoom in here. 
you can see the plume, which is a major part of the plume, and then it's um, materials falling off on either side. Um, and what happens is that the, um, the surface ice when this stuff lands just vaporizes. And it's really hot. If you're ice, you just get out of there. And instead of becoming liquid, um, it's, it's just sublimates, essentially. So you go through a phase transition directly from solid to vapor, vaporized. Um, and so that's exactly what happens here. Um, any evidence of tectonics that might have existed is gone because this thing is being so continually resurfaced that there's no evidence of like past shrinkage or deformation. And if you had impact cratering all over it, they would have to be relatively new. Surfaces is quite new. Okay, let's talk about Iowa's atmosphere. <clears throat> is there A, no atmosphere because there's no source of gas? B, there's some atmosphere, but it loses most of the gas it produces. Or C, a very dense atmosphere because of all of the volcanoes. Let's go on three, two, one. Okay, I didn't get anyone with a one. But everyone said that there was a source of gas. But there's some disagreement between B and C. So why don't you turn to your neighbor, mm -hmm. see if you can convince them of your answer. Leslie, like, you want to make a friend? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to. You want to make friends? Right? You all decided to raise. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's right, not arguing. Yeah. You're all correct. <laughs> all right, so you're ready to defend me. Yeah, uh, yeah, she is. Okay, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> I said, are you ready to defend me? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, let's do a revo. Your first step, if you're ready. Three. Two, one. Okay, interesting. So there's still some disagreement. Um, anyone want to defend their answer? Mm. As I stated before, you said at the beginning of class when you were describing mm -hmm. uh, IO, right? I don't know if it's a good person. Yeah. Um, like kind of describing it. And they're talking about like the erosion and the volcanoes, so kind of really talking about Io's atmosphere, really, but like really describing the planet, I guess, you could say, or how it is. So, I mean, that's why I think C, because it's just a dense atmosphere because of all the volcanoes. You said right. volcanoes when you're talking about it, describing it, so that would kind of make sense. Okay, and anyone disagree with that? Yeah. At first, I think it seems like Alex was. So she convinced you? No, no, no. no. I'm convinced that she changed my answer to B. Oh, you got changed your answer to B? Yes. Oh, interesting. Because, okay, why would that be? Um, because, um, I mean, I don't think it's based on the physics. Okay. Stuff here, that um, Volcano Ohio uh, does uh, outgas and then. And, that's just releases into the atmosphere, but some of it escapes the space leaving in the affected atmosphere. Right. So here's the picture that I thought you were referring to earlier. We did talk about this and we said here are our expectations. Large object, young surface, thick atmosphere. 
I said, these are the expectations. And then I told you that they were all wrong. That it is small. It does have a young surface, but that it doesn't have an atmosphere. And you can see that in this picture. Now, this is a little tricky to see because we haven't studied atmospheres yet. But the expectation would be, in fact, that you would have this massive atmosphere, right? That would make a lot of sense. We have all of this outgassing. And we know that for the terrestrial planets, if you have outgassing, you get an atmosphere. Except if you're getting bullied by a giant planet. In fact, the most massive planet in our solar system. Instead, let me show Oops, that's not helpful. Let me show you what happens instead. You get this. OK. So what is this? This is the North Pole of, um, of Jupiter. And the material that gets released from Io then travels along magnetic field lines and smashes into the top of Jupiter. OK, so this is called Aurora or Northern Lights. You might be familiar with it there. And in fact, see these little curl things? These are actually associated with the moons. This one here is all of the material from Io being connected by magnetic field lines into the planet and smashing into it. And then you can see the other two here, Ganymede and Europa. These are also the footprints. They're called um, auroral footprints, yeah. Why is the material uh, released instead of getting like, night? Yeah, so think about it this way. So we have big, big, massive Jupiter, and then very nearby, you have Io. So if I launch off of Io, very small, it doesn't take that much speed to get away from Io. But what am I going to head to almost immediately? Jupiter. Jupiter is right there. And it just so happens, like, if you take something like sulfur, and you put sulfur into space, the very first thing that happens is that light hits it, ionizes it, and once it's now charged, instead of dancing like it normally does, it follows magnetic field lines. And it starts to curl up the magnetic field lines from Io to the top of the atmosphere where it smashes into the planet. Yeah. If Jupiter has that much pull, why doesn't it pull Io? Yeah, it's a very good question. Very good question. And when we talk about Saturn, that's exactly why it has rings. So the only thing that has saved Io's life is that there are multiple planets all in resonance with one another. Likely, what happened to Saturn is there was indeed a massive moon there that has been completely shredded from tidal forces. Um, um, when we talk about um, Saturn as a system, you'll see that there are several moons as well. And what can happen is you can get too close and it just shreds the planet. Okay. We don't have this problem with our moon. Our moon's actually headed away from us for different reasons. Okay. And this is an example, just because I love these. Um, so this is someone who is at the North Pole and they forgot where they're pointing their camera. And that's what it looks like. So these are, this is a real picture, not simulation at all. When you go, people said it's exactly what it looks like. And these lines here, this is the magnetic field smashing into the planet, but these are particles from the sun. So they get accelerated, and when they hit, they hit oxygen atoms or nitrogen atoms, and they shine because they are basically being illuminated. So pretty cool. <laughs> I tried to go see this. I went to um, uh, Uppsala in Sweden for a conference. I was like, really excited to see the Northern Lights. So like, you're still like, thousands of kilometers from where you need to be. <laughs> you have to be really, really far north. Okay, so that was the first one. And then you ask questions about um, Europa. You're like, well, what does Europa have? Europa doesn't seem to have any volcanoes on it. Europa is the second one. Um, instead, it has weird looking stuff on it. What does that look like to you? <laughs> what's like what? When your eyes get red. When your eyes get red, yeah. Something and it sparks like the surface of the eyes, kind of. That's pretty good. Looks like, looks like an apple. Looks like an apple. Okay. Anything else you see here? So we see some scratches, um, weird coloring. Anything else? 
A weird focus point? Here? Yeah, what's that? That could be a crater, right? Remember we saw this on the moon? That it would be like a hole and then there'd be stuff coming out of it? That'd be like what was underneath the crater? In fact, that is an impact crater. What about this one? That even looks like it could be like an old one, right? So now we're starting to see a little bit of cratering. What does this tell you about the relative surface age? Which one's older, Io or Europa? Europa, Europa right? Because it has a crater at least on it. Okay, so let's zoom in here. Um, that's indeed an uh, impact crater. And there's all this weird stuff on it and weird color. But there's not many craters, right? And there's many, many fractures. But what the hell is going on here? Come on um, let's look at this part up here. See this piece? So this is that picture that we saw earlier. Um, that seems weird, right? Anything stand out to you here? Yeah. They look like like trains or something. Yeah, so maybe there's like a, a dog sledding team, right? <laughs> Um, I like the ice association though, but I want to focus first on this part. We're going to come back to that. I have a joke already lined up for that. Um, this part here, actually, we've seen this before. If we've looked at like pictures of the North Pole on North Pole, zoom in, you see that it's like fractured. And each of these little pieces, you know, look at these lines here, right? So this looks like maybe at one point was a line, but now it's sort of cracked off. And if I kind of like follow through, I'm like, okay, this seems to be newer, but this set of lines all look like they were potentially lined up at some point, right? Um, and if you, yeah. Very good. So what kind of tectonics? Well, not necessarily, um, I don't, we don't need like um, plate or non-plate, but this is ice, remember? So it's like ice tectonics. Okay, that's what we're looking for. And in fact, we've seen this on Earth. So these are ice flows. If you've seen the new planet Earth, um, there's like a little whale or a little seal here, like living his life. And then the orcas come, they like brush the ice flow and then eat the seal. Because yeah. that's how they're oh, lunch. Okay. So you gotta do. But this type of thing happens all the time, where the top of the ice layer freezes and then it rubs past each other and it creates these little um see the how, how it goes up on the edges looks like a crown um so these are a form of ice flow and so when we compare them to one another that's exactly what they look like they look like an iceberg field but you don't quite see down to the water underneath and that's because there's no atmosphere and it's the cold of space so they're really freezing all the way through this is kind of warm Right? You live on Earth, positive temperatures. This is really, really cold. Okay. Questions before we move on from this feature? Let's go back to that other feature. Um, we're going to zoom up here, look at these line features. Um, so, this piece here, you see how it looks like um, it's got like rings, like a tree. So this is sort of similar to what we've seen before with sea floor spreading, where we're producing more material by taking the stuff that's underneath the magma coming up and producing the sea floor. So if we wanted to imagine, let's tilt our head for a little bit, this could be like the um, east flank of South America, and this could be like the right uh, west flank of Africa. This would be how they fit into one another. And you have liquid here coming up, and then freezing, pushing apart the surface. Okay. And in fact, of course, we also see this on Earth. So here's a person, and uh, they don't have people here, I think. And here you see in between these cracked pieces of ice, there is water it's coming up. And as it comes to the surface, it gets cold and it freezes. So the freezing point for water is. Um, Sorry, the freezing point for water is lower than the, the temperature of the water underneath. 
So as soon as it makes it to the surface, right, because we know that ice flows on top of water, so it insulates it. So you can have hot water down here and cold ice on the top because the air up here is very, very cold. So as that water makes it to the surface, it sees the cold air and immediately freezes, right? And that's what you see in the middle here. Does that make sense? Okay, haven't lost anyone. So this gives us evidence that we see Europa here. Do you think there's a liquid ocean under there? No. Any other boats? The one representative speaks to the whole class. Do you think there is? And now you find it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so actually there is a liquid ocean. And this is why Europa is one of the coolest planets, moon, whatever. Um, this is what we think is in the interior of Europa. So we do think that it was differentiated, meaning that there is a metallic core. Metal went down to the surface. It has a rocky interior, probably, that makes up almost the whole thing. And then just at the very, very, very tippy top, there's water. And there's lots of it, OK? Around the entire planet, we see evidence for a subsurface ocean. This is kind of like the magma that we were thinking about, right? The only difference here is instead of this being liquid rock, it's liquid water. And the exterior, instead of being hard, uh, you know, well, it is hard. Um, this is hard water, ice. On Earth, we stand on hard rock. So do you see the analogy or did I lose everyone? I'm out of touch. Okay. Um, sure enough, so we saw that from the fractured surface. We saw evidence of tectonics, ice tectonics. We saw evidence of tidal heating, keeping that, that um, uh, little layer underneath warm. And this thing is tiny. So it's not holding on to any sort of radioactivity in the middle. Um, all of this heating is simply coming from tidal heating. And the biggest question we want to answer is whether, so there's a, a launch supposedly this year, I forget if it gets pushed back, whether it's full liquid ocean or warm convecting ice. Now, this one, ooh, we don't like this one, okay? Because this one allows for space whales, okay? You have a liquid ocean, you have minerals down here and a source of heat. We think this is all you need potentially for life. So there are some people who believe that life may have begun hydro, uh, at hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, very contentious fate. Some people say tide pools, but you could also potentially have a, a region where you know we can't access it. We can't drill down. This is many kilometers thick. The only way that material comes through is through these cracks. And that is what is coloring this. This coloration here, this weird orange coloration, is like crud. It's like organic material. We've attempted to determine what it is. It's a little ambiguous. Doesn't exactly say DNA, but it's organic. So it's got all of the building blocks for life in it. So we want to fly this mission and see if there's space whales. Or at least that's my hopes. I don't think they have that anywhere in this cave. But <laughs> we cool. Um, and when I said that there's a lot of water, I really, really meant it. So here's all of the water on Europa carried into a little ball. And here's all the water on Earth into a little ball. Wait, what? That doesn't make sense. Um, this is true, I promise you. The reason why there's so much so much less water here is because when the planets were forming, since the Earth forms closer to the sun, the sun has the ability to heat up that water and to boil it off. The farther you are away, the less likely you are to boil off that water. And so this retains almost all of the water that it started with, right? It doesn't boil any of that off. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas ours had to basically be delivered by asteroid and comet. Yeah. How do we know that? Uh, it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, okay. Very quick aside. We have flown by this. And it turns out that water with salt in it is pretty good at messing with magnetic fields. It's already in a very strong one. So it's inside of Jupiter's strong magnetic field. So as we pass by it, we can see how the water underneath the surface distorts the magnetic field of Jupiter. Isn't that weird? Um, and it allows us to measure how much water there is. Okay. Um, if, you've, if you've ever thought to yourself, you know, have aliens come to visit us, I promise you they haven't uh, for a number of reasons. This is one of the primary reasons. If they came to visit us, the most valuable thing on Earth, believe it or not, is not your Gucci bag. Um, it is not even your person to like be used as a tool. Um, it's this thing right here, water. As far as we understand, water is essential to life. And if you make the trek to come see us, you're going to want to take all of our resources. Our most valuable resource is drinking water. Not so confident. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we'll get to that when we get to astrobiology and why there may or may not be aliens. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. Just stretching. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, if we look at this part here, um, as you alluded to earlier, what is the true reason for this? It's an interchange. No, of course not. <laughs> but that would be funny if it was. Right, that's where all the Starbucks are on either side. Okay. Okay. So Europa only has ice tectonics, while Io has many volcanoes. Tidal heating on Europa is weaker than that on Io, mainly because A, Europa is smaller than Io, Europa is farther from Jupiter. Europa is not in an orbital resonance. Tidal heating is not important if liquid water is present, or none of the above tidal heating is greater on Europa. Put your fist up when you're ready. Vote on three, two, one. And it's like one in 10 of you are answering right now. Anyone have questions? Want me to clarify something about this question? Yeah. Can you explain it really quickly? Um, again, tidal yeah, so tidal heating, remember, was when we have something like um, like a planet. And the reason why you can get any of these features on Io is because it's getting squished, it's getting pulled more on one side than it is on the other, because one side is closer to Jupiter, for example, right? And that's forcing it to move into this weird shape, flexing back and forth between being circular and oval, circular and oval. And that would tear it apart if it weren't in resonance with the other bodies that it was orbiting, which allowed it to be in an elliptical orbit and make an elliptical shape. The friction is what is generating the heat internally. So it's like melting, it's due to the, um, but the, the source of the friction would be tidal heat. Because right. if you think about it, if, if Pluto is just out there living its own life, you know, if Io or Europa are just out there floating without Jupiter, they freeze. They're done. Right? The moon, for example, frozen all the way through. There's no volcanism on the moon currently. currently. Okay. Did that help clarify the question? Do we try and revote? No. So you want to so, like argue for any of these? No.
Yeah. All right. Actually, so you can the group uh, has the order for the uh, IO dose and the group. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they can hold it for here. Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. I think that's something similar to what they were asking about. So in fact, IO, Europa, and Ganymede are all in resonance with one another. So good. This one is eliminated. Um, Europa is smaller than IO. We can also eliminate that. It's bigger. Mm -hmm. Tidal heating is not important if liquid water is present. I didn't really talk about that, so we can eliminate that. And then it's just between these two. And you're absolutely right that Europa is farther than Jupiter, farther from Jupiter. So that is true. And remember that the gravitational forces are decreasing as you move away from an object. So if you're closer, like Io is, those tidal forces, in fact, are stronger. Okay. So that's why we were talking about the fact that the sun's tidal forces on us are very small. Whereas the moon, closer, but bigger, literally pulling water off of our surface. Moon is small, but close. Okay. Questions about this? Okay, so we're, we can't go through all the moons. We're gonna talk about a few more. Um, there's so many of them. So now you can see there's the relative size. There's Io, there's Europa, there's Ganymede, and it's big. Doesn't have any of this um, resurfacing. In fact, the surface looks really old. You can probably imagine why that is. It's still icy, but Which order are they going? Which one's closest? Io. Io is the closest. And then? Europa. And then? Ganymede. Okay, so why does Ganymede not have um, volcanic features or ice features that look like they're resurfaced? Yeah, it's not experienced as much tidal heating because it's far from Okay, so that's the natural steps that we're going to take there. You say, okay, this one's very close. It's getting pulled a lot. This one's far away, not really getting pulled that much. And in fact, when we look at the surface of Ganymede, you can't see it well there, but there indeed are much more craters. Okay. Um, Callisto is like the ugliest one of the bunch, it's like really dark, um, tough, filled with craters, icy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this little stuff there, the tiny impact craters, that's, these are impact craters there. Can you imagine? Okay, so like we get the, we're obviously blessed because we can see these pictures really close up. If I go like that, right? Like that's really close. Can you imagine having to study this like 50 years ago? And like, this is, this is what you would get, but it'd be worse. Like you get that. Like base your PhD off that. No, no thanks. Um, this one here, this is the coolest one. We'll talk about that in a few seconds. Um, a Titan. Oh, it's actually not even included on here. We're first going to talk about Enceladus. Enceladus is sick. Okay. That's uh, this one. It's the size of Colorado. Uh, what kind of features do you see? You see credit. Good. What's that? Where do you see erosion? Yeah, blue stream looking lines down here, right? So those look like rivers, right? Okay, anything else? Yeah. Right there, the top right is the ice cores from the volcano. Oh, interesting. This could be like a volcano type thing. Yeah. So we got volcanism. We got impact cratering. What are we missing? Erosion looking stuff. This? Yeah. Sorry, what are you saying? Auroras. Auroras? Yeah, actually, so this is backlit, so it's the same color, but it's not quite the same. We'll get to that in a second. This thing up here. Weird long lines. That'd be like tectonics, It'd be ice tectonics again. But there's a really strong dichotomy down here 
no, no impact crater. Up here, lots of it. Not so much, lots of it. So what do we tell about these two different surfaces? Different age, which one's younger? One's at the bottom. And those are called the tiger stripes. Beautiful name. They're named after um, the three major rivers in the Mesopotamia. And basically they looked like they're rivers. And so they got named after rivers, but they're not rivers. These are tectonic features. These are cracks in the surface. And when we looked at, so we flew by this with something called Cassini. And what was cool is if we, so this is literally illuminated by the sun. We didn't bring like a flashlight. So when you sit behind the planet, looking across the bottom of it, you saw these plumes coming out. This is basically called cryovolcanism. So it's volcanism, but it's not magma, it's liquid water. And in here, you would have tons of plumes, just littered with plumes of water just pouring out, but not up here. Outstanding problem. We do not understand why this is happening. So we think that they are unlike Europa. Europa had a, an ocean all the way around. We think that Enceladus only has a southern ocean for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> We're still working on it. <laughs> and up here, you have these little cracks through this um, enormous amount of ice melting through and then just spraying the surface. And the reason why this whole area lacks any evidence for impact cratering is because it's constantly being filled in with ice. So whereas these other ones, the material, for example, on Io is being whisked away pretty quickly. This one's well, it's like farther away outside from Saturn. Saturn's smaller. All of these things are working in Enceladus's favor to allow it to actually shape the ice in a different way here. Okay. Um, questions about Enceladus? Okay. Then the coolest one is Titan. On the 14th of January, wait, 2005, wait, wait. the Huygens Space Crypt. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to watch a really cool video. Um, so this is going to combine two different types of data. And we're going to skip ahead because these are really long. But this picture here is a real picture of Titan. Um, what do you notice about Titan? Uh, yeah, that's a different moon in the background. Yeah. It's super smooth. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, it looks very hazy. Looks hazy. Does this have an atmosphere? Maybe. Maybe. That blue stuff reminds me of like how when you look at pictures of Earth's atmosphere, it's like kind of like a pink color down here. That's not only absolutely correct, it's also the same explanation. Okay, so very good. So now you've learned how to identify atmospheres without noticing that you're identifying atmospheres. So indeed, this is an atmosphere and it's hazy. I don't see the surface in this picture, right? That's what um, I interpreted. So it looked smooth, it looked like there was no features. So people for a long time really just thought, oh, this thing's you know, cold and featureless. No, it's got a really thick atmosphere. In fact, the thickness of this atmosphere primarily composed of nitrogen, um, is so large that if you just strapped on wings, this is not very big, you could like float <laughs> as a bird. So we are sending something called Dragonfly, which is a mission, which is a rotocopter mission. Like we have, uh, what are they called? Like drones, you know, with the four thing. We're gonna fly it around on here. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and we'll see why we wanna do this in a few seconds. So let's first start with this view from Huygens. Um, this is a descent probe from 2005. So it flew on Cassini. They were together and then it was like, bye. And so then um, this probe went all the way down. And as it goes down through the atmosphere, um, it uses cameras, it uses a, um, a bunch of different types of instruments in order to look at what the surface looks like. Because this is the closest that we had ever gotten to it. Now Cassini then would go by it many more times and help us construct a better image. But let's just start with this initial um, descent, this is cool. Craft culminated a seven-year journey to the surface of Nipsey with the Huygens probe. Okay. Okay, it's getting closer. You can't tell yet. Okay, there we go. Hold on. 
There we go. This is us landing. Uh, and this is color correcting. So they do that by bringing little samples from their just know what the color is. Because the atmosphere, as you saw, is very beautiful. color correcting. What do you see here? Rocks. Are they? They're smooth rocks. It has mounds that look like it's been carved. And people were like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, and they weren't kidding. Um, there is indeed hydrological features. So this is that 360 view, um, but it didn't have the time and effort to, to tear up. And what you see here is that um, on Titan, water and nitrogen um, basically play the same role. There is a, a methane cycle, okay? Um, and methane has a hydrologic cycle. You have lakes and seas of liquid methane. You're like, what? Um, we'll be even more wetted about this. This is, again, a backlit image. So this is a picture of Titan. It's called a composite image, where we take a bunch of different pictures. You can't try to focus on one area to get really good resolution. And so we tried to do this. Um, what's that right there? Is that a volcano or a nuclear weapon on the surface? That is the reflection of the sun off of a methane lake on the surface. As is that. So this is looking, the sun is off in that direction, bouncing here and bouncing towards us, the audience. And similarly here, bouncing off here at a different angle through the atmosphere towards us. Okay, so this is why Titan is sick. <laughs> okay, so it has a whole hydrological cycle um, similar to ours. We're gonna talk about that more in detail. Um, the reasons for this, as we'll come to see, have everything to do with tidal heating. Um, these are the only things that can cause geologic activity out in these moons. Whereas on the um, terrestrial side, the planet's interior to Jupiter, so the five that we talked about, most of that comes from radioactivity in the interior. Okay, so this is the major distinction I want to draw between the two of them. Um, smaller objects here cool faster, which is generally true except if they have this new fun source of eating. 
And that is specifically that icy materials are much easier to deform, much easier to change the shape of ice than it is to change the shape of rock. Try it at home. Honestly, you can do it with your hands in one case, and then you can't put the other, right? Break some concrete versus breaking a block of ice. Okay. Does this process make sense to people? Do people have questions? Okay, so on Tuesday, we'll start with light. And um, if you looked at your homework already, uh, homework four, that should be pushed back a week because it asks you tons of questions about light and you just you won't be able to answer. And then on Thursday, um, I'm going to have a sub, which is another professor from our department. She's going to come in and start to discuss. If we don't get through light, she'll finish light. Um, otherwise, uh, We'll talk about the climate of terrestrial planets. So we'll really briefly, two or three weeks, talk about how atmospheres work. And then we will get to Jovian planets. And then we'll get to comets and everything else. Questions, comments, concerns? OK, thanks, everyone. Like, I think now moons are yeah kinda. yeah moons are kind of cool okay.